Okay, hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining me again for another biotechnology live stream. My name is Dr. Danielle Snowflack and I am the Senior Director of Education at Evotech and I am just happy to be here chatting with you again um, in the comfort of our homes or classrooms uh, and to be giving you some training in biotechnology. Um, my, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be able to offer this to you. Um, through YouTube. So for those of you who may have only heard of Evotech recently or haven't heard of us at all, um, you know, we are the biotechnology education company. We were founded over 30 years ago by Dr. Jack Trickshan, who was a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, and what he saw were these amazing innovations in the laboratory that weren't being translated into the classroom to really excite and invigorate students um, to become engaged in biotechnology careers. Um, and so thus, Edvotech was born to demystify biotechnology for the classroom and to make it affordable, easy, and accessible for teachers to perform these experiments. So today we work with educators all over the world to demystify science and to foster the next generation of re uh, scientists through hands-on active learning activities. Um, and we really work to make biotechnology accessible to all labs, whether it's uh, research, outreach, biohacker, homeschool, or, you know, um, you know classroom teachers. You know, we, we want to um, make biotechnology accessible for everyone. So today, in this live stream, we are going to be talking about restriction enzymes. Um, they are amazing. I personally think they are a incredibly vers an incredibly versatile um, biotech tool that chops DNA into pieces based on its sequ on their sequence. Um, the kit we're running today is kit number 225, which is DNA fingerprinting using restriction enzymes. Um, this is a forensic science experiment. Um, we're not going to talk a ton about forensic science in this experiment in, in this live stream. We've done um, those discussions before. You know, I'll give the basics of forensic science, but I will provide links to our other forensic science workshops if you want to learn more about those specifics. We're really going to be focusing on restriction enzymes. And the utility of these restriction enzymes um, has made molecular cloning, DNA mapping, sequencing, and, varied geno and various genome-wide studies possible, which really launched the era of biotechnology. So these enzymes were you know, discovered and purified um, in, the in the 60s and, I think, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, some are still being purified today. Um, but really, they were recognized as innovation um, in 1978 with a Nobel Prize. Um, and today, this is technology that we can use in our classroom, which I think is amazing. Um, this demonstration will be recorded and the slides will be available on our website. If you want to be notified when they're posted, um, please fill out the form. We will be putting the link in the chat box. Um, that form, I will send the slides to you. And we are also offering professional development certificates um, to those who watch live. Um, so if you want us to send us a, you a certificate by email, please just um, complete that link um, and then we will um, and then we'll send you a certificate. Um, actually, let me put that link in. Let me put that form in real quick. Um, that should be it. Um, if you have problems with the link, let me know in the chat. Um, and so we're only going to keep this link live for an hour after the presentation, so please try to fill it out by um, by, we're going to end around 4.30, so try and fill it out by around 5.30 Eastern time. So let's get started with some of the science. Um, so again, we're talking about forensic science in this, and, and we're using restriction enzymes to analyze our DNA. Um, and so this particular experiment is a forensic science simulation. Uh, forensic science is not a single kind of science. Like it is actually the application of science to and scientific knowledge and techniques to answer questions within a legal system. Um, and because it is not a single scientific discipline, assays from many different disciplines, including molecular biology and biotechnology, are going to be used to analyze our crime scene evidence. Now, um, you know, if you are a crime scene investigator, after you identify a sample and you um, discover that it is blood, the forensic scientists would turn the DNA over to um, researchers, uh, 
you know, investigators who are um, going to analyze it using DNA fingerprinting, um, which is going to analyze the DNA um, using restriction enzymes. In humans, our DNA is packaged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. And although most of the DNA in our chromosomes is going to be unique between individuals, there are small sequence differences or polymorphisms which are going to occur at specific locations within the DNA genome. And so these are heritable differences. And that means that they are passed from mom to dad during um, you know, embryonic, you know, during that um, fertilization of the egg. Um, and they are going to segregate um, following normal Mendelian, in a normal Mendelian fashion. So these polymorphisms can include single base pair changes and repetitive DNA elements. Um, and we can use many different techniques to um, analyze polymorphisms at different loci within the human genome. So different specific locations within the genome. Um, now, I, I kind of think of the term DNA fingerprinting as an analogy um, in itself to describe this biotechnology technique. So if we think about our actual fingerprints, actual fingerprinting, so we can look at our hands. Um, and, you know, at the macro level, all of our hands look the same. You know, we've got four fingers and a thumb and they're attached to the palm. The palm is attached to the wrist. Um, but when we look closer at our fingerprints, that is when we see a difference. And so those are going to be the loops and whirls and twirls, which are going to differentiate us from one another. And so in the same way, polymorphisms can be used to distinguish between individuals. Um, and, you know, if we're looking, if we're thinking about a specific position, so let's look at chromosome two on this figure in that position A. Um, you know, this is going to be one of the loci, one of this, the locus, it's going to be one of the loci, one of the specific regions on a chromosome that we're analyzing for DNA differences. Um, and this could be a place where our DNA will be, um, will be analyzed, you know, at different places. Um, and this is, a, they're going to be analyzed, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to have a little bit of a frog in my throat. So if we look at one of these locations, um, you know, um, we could imagine that I would have an A at that location and you might have a T at that lo at the specific location. Um, but a 50% chance of having a different nucleotide, I mean, that's not great odds, you know, because I could have um, an A at that location and someone else could have a T and then another person would have an A and, you know, you know, that alone is not enough to tell us um, what's happening at one location. And so we do have a comment in the chat box, you know, that 300 million to, to one. Um, and so that is not just looking at one location. So that statistic is looking at all of the CODIS loci. Um, so, um, you know, we have, you know, so many nucleotides within our um, within our genome. And, you know, again, the probability of, you know, having a polymorphism that has an A or a T, you know, you may, there is, it's not a simple 50-50 distribution because we do find certain alleles find their way into different populations more frequently. But again, if we multiply by all those different loci, you know, it does get to be a smaller and smaller, more vanish, uh, more vanishingly small, um, and more vanishingly small profile. And so this is the reason why we do need to use multiple restriction enzymes for our digests or multiple um, points of reference when we are looking at um, the DNA genome um, for this DNA fingerprinting experience, experiment because we want to take, so this um, particular graphic has 13 CODIS loci. There are actually 20 CODIS loci that people are looking at. Um, and these make then incredibly specific when we take the probability at all those different locations. And so I'm not actually going to talk about it here. I do talk about it in one of our previous live streams. Um, there's also more information within some of these loci, um, you know, because we are talking, uh, we can also look at VNTRs, which are these variable number of tandem repeats. And so there we're not just looking at A versus T, but we're actually looking at the number of repeats at that location. And those number of re repeats can be different from, um, you know, both of the parental chromosomes as well. Um, so DNA from fingerprinting using restriction enzymes is an older technique, which is likely not used as much 
Um, in the research labs today, we're probably going to rely more on um, genome sequencing um, and analyzing the points, you know, using PCR and sequencing. Um, but this is the original technique that was used, um, you know, in the UK um, and adapted all over the world. And so, um, you know, once we have these points of reference, um, then one would turn to CODIS. Um, and this is where you have that vanishingly small um, probability of having DNA sequences match up. Um, and so, um, you know, a single nucleotide polymorphism is going to be an A or T. Um, and if we're thinking about DNA sequences and restriction enzymes, you know, restriction enzymes are these highly specific endonucleases. So they are these enzymes that are going to be able to um, cut DNA specifically based on its sequence. And so, um, you know, we do use these enzymes because of their specificity. Because if I have an A, so if we're looking at um, the recognition site we have here on the screen right now, um, you can see that we have, we're using echo R1 enzyme, and we have that GAATC recognition site. And so if I have an A at that first A position and someone else has a T, you could see that my DNA will be cut and someone else's will not be cut. And so, you know, that is how the sequence of the restriction enzyme is going to um, be important, okay? And so if we look at the schematic, we can see where um, our enzymes are cutting. So they are cutting in that black arrow, um, you know, where, and we can see that we have those two overhangs. Um, but if we did not have the um, restriction site there, we would not be able to cut. And so when we actually analyze the data, we will see something like this. And so um, if we look at the schematic, we have a segment of DNA between those two black arrows. There are two potential RIFLIPs here. We have the one denoted by a yellow um, triangle and one by a red. Um, and so if we were to just look at the pieces of DNA and they were uncut, they would look exactly the same. However, when we do cut with echo R1, we do see these different results. So with the sample A, the cut site is closer to the middle. So our two bands are kind of closer in size. Um, when we cut with B, you can see it's closer to what I would think of as the three prime end of that region of DNA. And we can see that we have one band that's a lot larger and one band that is a lot smaller. And so the differences in our restriction patterns are going to allow us to distinguish between people. Um, and so that is the basic background for this kit. Um, it is a restriction digest kit in terms of a forensic science lesson. Um, I'm not gonna dive into any more into forensic science here, um, again, because I have covered it in past live streams. Um, I wanna really focus on the enzymes themselves in this workshop. And so um, I encourage you to check out one of these other webinars. If you sign up to get the slide um, using that link, um, you know, you will be able to click and this will take you right to the live stream and the slides associated. Um, you know, we do have one that focuses specifically on DNA fingerprinting and on the specifics of the technology um, and the ethics of using DNA fingerprinting, which is a very important lesson um, to bring into forensic science discussions. So let's talk about the Restriction Digest experiment itself. Um, so this is a, an experiment that has three modules. Um, we're gonna digest the DNA, we're gonna analyze it using electrophoresis, and then visualize the results. And so we're actually gonna start this experiment in the middle um, with the agarose gel electrophoresis. Um, and that is for time constraints. You know, we have about an hour together um, and the restriction digest generally goes 30 to 60 minutes, um, depending on the time you have. Um, and so if I were to do that, um, you know, you're, it's gonna take 15 minutes to set up, get everything ready. Um, so it's a little bit of a Betty Crocker experiment. I am going to, I already did the digest. We're gonna run the results together on the gel um, and talk about the nature of enzymes and go from there. All right. So let's talk about electrophoresis while I begin to load our gel. Um, I'm going to switch over to my camera um, and my lab setup. So you should be able to see my lab setup now. Um, and so I am going to start talking um, about electrophoresis. So what do we need to do electrophoresis? So 
first, you know, we're going to need our samples. Electrophoresis is a super versatile technique. Um, you may have joined me for other live streams. If you have, you've seen I've done dyes. Um, you know, we can do nu uh, nucleic acids. So you could do DNA, RNA, or you could do proteins. And so in this lesson, we are going to do the digested DNA. Um, I hope you all can hear me okay. I am having a little bit of a frog in my throat. I'm not sure where it came from um, because I feel okay. But oh, so what I've done is um, off screen, I took the comb out of my gel. Um, you know, I'm going to remove the end caps um, from the gel and place it into the chamber. One thing about this experiment is that there are seven samples to analyze. So I did use the eight well feature of this comb. And that's important in this case um, because we want to make sure that we can load all the samples on the same gel. Um, it's a little bit trickier to load. The wells are smaller. And so if your students are less experienced with gel loading, you know, you might want to have them practice with a practice gel first, simply because the wells are smaller. Um, and it can be a little bit difficult to load if you're inexperienced. Um, if you want to use the larger wells, what you can do is pour your long 10, your long 14 centimeter gel and do two six well combs. And in that case, your students will be loading into the larger wells. Um, you're going to want to run a ladder on both of those so that you can compare the sizes. Um, and then, you know, your students will load into the larger wells. So we're going to load 40 microliters of each of our samples. And why do I have, oh, I have to adjust my micro pipette down to the correct volume. So um, to load our samples, we are using an adjustable volume micro pipette here. Um, this is an important tool in the microbiology, in the molecular biology lab. Um, because it's going to allow us to precisely measure the amount of samples that we are loading. Um, it's going to allow us to measure the amount of restriction enzymes that we're adding. Um, and that's, it's incredibly important that we have precision at this place um, because, you know, we are going to be adding five microliters of restriction enzyme to um, our samples. Um, you know, and right now, so I'm loading 40 microliters of each sample into this gel, into these wells. I'm starting with my DNA ladder. Um, that's the way I like to load my gels. Um, I always like to have the ladder in the same lane. Um, just it, it helps me think about things visually. Um, anyway, so talking back about um, our restriction digest, you know, if we're only loading five microliters, you know, we want an instrument that is going to be precise um, simply because if we were to add or subtract a single, um, a single um, new microliter of that enzyme, you know, we'd be increasing or decreasing um, what we were looking at by about 20%, which is a huge difference. Um, you know, with 40 microliters, a single microliter doesn't matter as much, um, you know, but with restriction enzymes, um, and these very precise experiments, you do want to be careful um, to be precise in your pipetting. Because I'm pipetting around this camera, I might not be doing the best job, um, you know, but we are trying. So what I'm doing is I am loading right now our DNA samples. These are the pre-digested samples that come with the kit. These are our crime scene DNA samples. Um, and then we are going to be performing the digest on the other samples, which are going to be the ones that have been um, identified at the crime scene, if we're thinking about our crime scene scenario. Um, agarose, in this case, is our medium for separation. Um, we can think about it like science jello. Um, you know, if you were to feel it, it would feel like a very solid, it'd feel solid, but soft and pliable. Um, this is going to act as a, a molecular sieve or like a strainer, which is going to help us separate our molecules by size. Um, and I will talk about what is going on in the gel um, later in our presentation. Next thing that's important for electrophoresis is going to be our buffer. This is a mixture of um, buffer and salt, and this is important to have for two reasons. One is that water is a really poor conductor of electricity. And the way we're going to push our DNA through our gel is to use that to create an electrical field and the charge of the, the charge of the field will influence the way the molecules are moving. 
So right now I am loading my restriction digest samples. Um, I have them in PCR tubes here. Fun fact, I, one of the pieces of lab equipment I do not have here is a water bath or an incubator that would hold at 37 degrees. Um, so I actually did my restriction digest in our thermal cycler in the Edvo cycler too. Um, and the nice thing about the Edvo cycler too is that it does have an instant incubate feature um, and you can hold it at 37 for, you know, I held it at 37 for an hour while I was doing the digest, um, you know, and it was nice. Um, you know, you do need to have the PCR tubes on hand to be able to do that, um, which I did because I do run PCR at home in my little basement lab setup. Um, and it was nice and convenient because, you know, all the samples came out. I added the loading die and then we were ready to go. Um, so we actually, going back to the buffer, we do send it to you as a concentrate. Um, you know, we, we need the eye. I don't know if I ever got to the second reason why we use buffer. Um, we do want to keep the molecules charged. And by having a buffer, we can keep the pH um, at an appropriate level to keep the charge on our samples. All right, so our gel is loaded. Um, you know, uh, if, if you wanna learn more about the specifics of electrophoresis, you know, we do have other live streams as well where we will talk more about it. Um, so I'm done loading my gel. Um, these are restriction digested samples. Um, I've already, I have my gel in here, it's loaded. Um, our chamber is wired at each, our chamber contains the buffer and the gel. It's wired at each end with terminals that are gonna be connected to leads. Our leads are collected to a power supply, which is gonna generate the current that we need for separation. So I am going to hit go um, and you know let the electrophoresis um, begin. So one thing I always like to do is I like to check that I can see my bubbles um, at both terminals and I'll come back here, I'll take a look at the gel and make sure that the dye is also traveling in the correct direction, you know, from black to red just to make sure that I've got everything hooked up correctly, um, you know, because as many fail safes as we do put into our equipment um, to make sure that it is, that your experiments run as quickly and easily as possible, one place that we can make a mistake is here at the leads. Um, and so you wanna make sure you plug the black into the black, the black, red into the red so that your charge is going in the correct direction. All right, so um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, the equipment I'm using. Um, I am using the Edvotech M12, um, which actually can run two gels concurrently or one long gel. Um, so I'm actually only running one gel right now, um, but you know, which would be one student group, but you can actually get two gels into here, um, meaning that you could run two student groups in this one electrophoresis chamber. Um, so if we were in a teaching lab, this setup could accommodate, you know, up to two lab groups with six students each. Um, but we do have two outlets, so you could have a second, um, you add a second M12 to get more capability from this, from the power supply. Um, we also offer an M36, which is pretty remarkable because it can run up to six gels at once, which is a whole classroom uh, of samples in one chamber, which I think is pretty amazing. We, I'm using the DuoSource 150 today. That is our power supply, um, which is going to generate the current we need to perform the separation. Um, now that's gonna be the right voltage for the vast majority of agarose gel electrophoresis experiments you're running. Um, and it's a nice affordable option. But if you're gonna wanna run more electrophoresis chambers, or you might wanna do polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, which is gonna um, require it, you can still run a page gel using the duo source, but you might wanna run it at a different speed or change the speed after you run through the stacking gel, but before you get to the actual separating gel. Um, and, and you might wanna change the um, current there and so then you would want the quad resource um, which is fully adjustable from 100 to 300 volt or from what 10 to 300 volts um, and if you're looking for a new uh, all-in-one solution we have the Evotech Edge um, I this unit is fantastic I've gotten my hands on it um, and hopefully you know we'll be featuring it soon in a new live stream and then so this unit actually is going to combine the electrophoresis chamber, the power supply, and the visualization system all into one unit. And I just think it looks so good in that photograph that I had to share it with everybody today. All right, so let's get to the restriction digests and the enzymes. So personally, I feel like one of the most significant discoveries 
of molecular biology, um, you know, that I can think of is this class of enzymes that can slice DNA in a specific and reproducible manner. And those are restriction enzymes um, or endonucleases. You might hear um, more about that, uh, that particular term. And so these endonucleases target the double-stranded DNA at specific sequences, and they cut through, they break through the DNA backbone, and this is going to fragment our DNA into smaller pieces. Digestion of the same piece of DNA with different enzyme actually does create unique patterns, and that's one of the things that we're testing in this experiment. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the electro the setup later, um, but we are basically digesting DNA from two suspects with two different enzymes. And what we will see is that, um, you know, digesting this DNA creates unique pattern with different enzymes creates unique patterns. And the relationship between these cut sites and the order and the number of them and more allows us to characterize a gene or a piece of the genome or a plasmid without knowing its sequence. Um, and this was very important um, before DNA sequencing became more inexpensive and readily available. Restriction enzymes are actually a naturally occurring tool um, used in bacteria. So much like CRISPR, uh, which is very popular in the news recently, you know, again, another recent Nobel Prize winning technology, um, restriction and dinuclease is actually evolved in bacteria as a defense against viral attacks. So you can almost think of it as like an immune system. So um, this picture, which is uh, fantastic, it's from the Science Photo Library. Um, and what we can see is in this photograph, we have several of these bacteriophage virions that are attached to the outside of the bacterial cell. And in some of them, if you look, you can actually see the genetic material being injected into the cell. And that is the way a virus works. So a virus is going to attach to a cell. It's going to, it's going to break open the cell membranes and walls, inject its DNA, and then replicate within a host. And so um, these restriction enzymes evolved to basically break up that invading DNA. So as the invading viral DNA enters the cell, the enzymes recognize that the DNA is foreign based on specific modifications that have been made to the DNA. And so this can include methylation or the lack of methylation at certain sequences, um, you know, and a lot of different um, modifications. And so the DNA is targeted by the cell, um, the restriction enzymes target specific sequences, and then it's going to chop that invading DNA into pieces to prevent it from replicating within the bacterial cell, which would generally um, end in the cell lysing, so the cell being killed. The first restriction enzymes were um, identified and purified from native bacteria using chromatographic procedures like ion exchange chromatography, uh, which is going to separate proteins based on their charge, or size exclusion chromatography, which is going to separate proteins by size. Um, and those are all experiments you can try with your students in class. And these techniques um, separate molecules based on their physical properties and create individual pools of pure enzyme that are basically freed, purified away from other cytoplasmic proteins. And so what we're looking at in this picture on the gel is actually an experiment that we offer where your students can purify the ECHOR1 enzyme from a cell extract. And we analyze um, our fractions, so the different um, you know, pools of extract that we get off of our column after performing the chromatography. And we're analyzing these by restriction digest, which lets us visualize which enzyme fractions are more pure, um, both by, by their activity and then which fractions also contain the restriction enzyme. And what you can see is that we have a single band of DNA in most of those lanes, but in the top gel, um, those rightmost two, you can see the DNA digesting. And that's where our enzyme is. And so if we were in the lab, we would then take those two fractions, um, those two pools of enzyme, and use them for our further experiments. Today, um, using molecular cloning techniques, including restriction enzymes to cut and piece DNA um, together, we can tag proteins um, with we we can tag proteins with these special um, protein tags um, that we can then use during affinity chromatography. And so this method tags proteins with these specific amino acid sequences that interact with a chromatography matrix. 
And affinity chromatography is a fantastic innovation because it allows for fast and easy purification, which can actually protect our protein against degradation or loss of activity. So we may only have to do one step instead of doing multiple steps to get our restriction enzymes at the end or any protein that we're able to see do in person, purify in person. So I'm gonna take a quick break I'm just gonna look at our gel. Our gel is running in the correct direct. Our, our samples are running in the correct direction. Um, we can see the loading dye beginning to move. Um, you know, we're going from black to red. Um, you know, our negative terminal to our positive terminal. Um, and so that's great. Our samples are separating the way we need them to. Okay. Um, I always like I like to check. Um, all right. So um, today um, we are able to purify our restriction enzymes. Um, using tagged proteins. And so the 1978 Nobel Prize actually honored the discovery of these restriction enzymes and their applications to molecular genetics. Um, and I do think that, you know, they are one of the coolest tools in the biotechnology toolbox. So restriction enzymes actually can give us, uh, you know, restriction enzymes are different. And so there are actually five classes of restriction enzymes. Um, that have been isolated from bacteria and they all differ in the way they cut DNA in the cofactors that they need and in the sequences they recognize. But um, your type two enzymes are gonna be the most common in the laboratory. And so here we're looking at a crystal structure of an enzyme bound, of the enzyme or restriction enzyme bound to DNA. Um, and these restriction enzymes are going to bind to DNA as homodimers as seen here. And a homodimer is a complex, a protein complex, where we have two of the same proteins binding to one another. And that's important um, because of the way that the enzymes recognize DNA. So um, each, pro each of these proteins has several domains, including a DNA binding domain, which is gonna bind with the, the recognition site in the DNA, and an endonuclease domain that cleaves the DNA. Um, because they're the same enzyme, they are going to recognize the same nucleotides. And again, that becomes important because our enzymes recognize palindromic sequences, which means they, are, they read the same letters um, on the five prime strand and on the three prime strand. Um, most of the uh, type two enzymes are gonna require magnesium as a cofactor. Um, and that means that it's important that we have the correct buffer. So we're doing our restriction digest in the correct buffer for best results. Restriction enzymes can either cleave the recognition site at the center of the DNA strands, which yields a blunt end, or at a staggered position, which leaves us with overhangs called sticky ends. And to illustrate this, first consider the recognition site and cleavage pattern of Hay3. So that's the one on the bottom, the blunt ended enzyme. I need one second. Let me take a sip. And so this enzyme um, complex, so the two, um, the two monomers, which form that homodimeric complex. Um, so this enzyme is going to bind to the DNA and cut both strands at the same position, which is gonna generate fragments without an overhang. These so-called blunt ends can be joined with any other blunt ends. So there's no sequence specificity when you try to join them back together um, in a restriction digest. And that's good in some circumstances, um, in others it might be a problem. In contrast to Hay3, Enzymes like ECHOR1 are gonna cleave in a staggered form. So um, the way that the DNA binding and the endonuclease sites line up is that they're actually breaking the DNA um, backbone in a staggered location. And you can see that in the figure um, you know, of ECHOR1, you can see where the red line is gonna intersect between, between the two nucleotides. I mean, it's cleaving the DNA backbone um, in that staggered, Form. And so the resulting fragments project short overhangs of single-stranded DNA with complementary sequences. And these are referred to as sticky ends because the single strands can interact or stick to other overhangs with a complementary sequence. And so um, the base pairing becomes important here because again, you would need to have an A, G, C, T end to be able to base pair in the correct orientation. And so if we were cloning these genes into vectors, we would use the sticky ends for specificity and cloning, but we're gonna use this but we're gonna use this sequence specificity for our analysis. So the actual overhangs isn't as important to us as the sequence that is being cut. And so digestion of the same piece of DNA with different enzymes will create unique patterns that can tell us about their sequence. And then this is 
the principle between, behind the DNA fingerprinting experiment that we're doing today. The probability that a given enzyme will cut or digest a piece of DNA is directly proportional to the length of its recognition site. Statistically, an enzyme will cut will average one cut for every four to the n base pairs, where n is the, the length of the restriction site, the recognition site. So, for example, an enzyme that recognizes a four base pair long sequence, like Hay3, which was one of the enzymes in our last slide, that's going to cut DNA once every 256 base pairs, or four to the four. While an enzyme that recognizes a six base pairs long site, like ECHOR1, is going to cut about once every 5,000 base pairs, which is four to the six. Um, so, you know, around you know, 4,100, not 5,000. I don't know why I said that. <clears throat> um, therefore, uh, the longer a DNA molecule is, the greater the probability is that it will con contain one or more restriction sites. So if we're looking at these two sequences that I have um, on the screen, um, we have a lambda phage DNA, which is, you know, um, over 48,000 base pairs. And then we have a plasmid, which is more like 4,300 base pairs. So, you know, we're going up many orders of magnitude between the two. Um, you know, or, well, not many orders of magnitude, one order of magnitude. Um, but, you know, we are going, you know, adding a lot of DNA there. Um, and then we can see that there are differences. So if we're using ECHOR1 to digest um, the plasmid, we're only going to get one cut um, within that sequence. And we can see that within the lambda genome, we're actually cutting it multiple times. So we're cutting it five times. Now, if we were to um, digest human chromosomal DNA with that enzyme, it's gonna cut over 70, 700,000 times if we're considering that the genome has three billion base pairs and it's cutting around every 4,000 base pairs. Now, but it may only cut our plasmid once. And so, um, that becomes important when we're doing molecular cloning experiments, um, especially when we're using plasmids, because we don't want to chop our plasmid to bits um, before we drop our genes into it. Um, so talking about molecular cloning, you know, there are many applications for the use of restriction enzymes in the research laboratory. Um, if you were joining me last week, we talked about experiment 301, where you're performing a molecular cloning experiment. So you're dropping an antibiotic resistance gene into um, a plasmid. And so molecular cloning techniques allow researchers to isolate, combine, and pre reproduce specific DNA sequences. For example, um, you know, I'm a fruit fly biologist. I did my PhD in a fly lab, and I often would want to clone a gene to study its biochemistry. And so what we could do was use PCR to amplify it or cut the gene out of the, the fly genome using restriction enzymes, um, using a ligase, we would pop it into an expression vector, and then we could produce the protein in bacterial cells. And we could then study the protein further in the lab. Um, and if you saw, there was a great New York Times spread um, uh, interactive about the, um, you know, vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, they talk about the way they clone their gene into an expression vector and then grow up lots of that plasmid to be able to make the RNA vector. Um, you know, it's a really cool um, way to have your students start thinking about real world applications of the techniques that they're doing in the lab. Um, restriction enzyme mapping is going to describe the, allow us to describe the sequence of DNA by identifying the location of restriction enzymes and their orientation to one another. Um, this could be a single plasmid or larger pieces of genomic DNA. And then today we are doing the restriction enzyme mapping, oh sorry, DNA fingerprinting, um, which is going to identify differences within DNA based on its sequence. And again, while we think of this as a tool primarily for forensic science, it's a fantastic application of it, we can use it in many different ways, including um, the identification of parentage, um, in genealogical research to identify relatives, um, distance and distant and close. And then we can also use it in medical research to identify potential disease-causing alleles, um, which we could then, um, you know, once we identify those alleles, we can use them for diagnosis of genetic conditions. Now, um, let's talk about the enzymes that are included with the kit. Um, we actually include, one thing you may notice is that, let's see, can you see this okay? Um, I did stick a, pull the label off and put a blue piece of tape there to give us some more contrast. Let's see if I block it from my light. 
Ooh, I need some of that light. Um, but what you should be able to see, oftentimes <coughs> when you receive the tube and you look at it, it seems like it might be empty, empty, or there is like a dried out powdery material in the tube. And that's actually your restriction enzyme. So we remove the water um, from a sample in, from our enzymes in a process called lyophilization. So this is cool science in itself, right? Because lyophilization is a process where we're going to super cool these enzymes. We, we put them into the tube as a liquid solution. We're going to super cool um, the solution to, um, you know, ultra low temperature um, and then use a which causes the um, water to freeze. And then using a vacuum, we're actually gonna make it sublimate. So we're gonna take the water, go from frozen to gas. We're gonna pull all that water out. And so we're left with a dry solid enzyme. And so this is really important because it's gonna extend the shelf life of our enzymes and make it more convenient for transport and storage. Um, so one important thing to do when you set up your restriction digest is to Get the tubes you're going to spin them down to bring the powder to the bottom of the tube you know because every unit of enzyme in there is important um you know you don't want the powder to fly out of the tube you know sometimes it might get stuck on the lid um you know you want to spin all that powder down um, and then rehydrate the powder as per the kit directions and so you know we think this is a super innovation um and we offer it with a lot of our kits to kind of make uh you know our teachers lives to simplify things So to perform the experiment, you know, I put the table up here, the table of sample, the, the, the table of um, how we would prepare the samples. Um, and you're gonna set up the experiment as per the experimental protocol. And so we have two suspects, we're doing two restriction digests for each of them. Each of those restriction digests is with a different enzyme. So we have our enzyme one and our enzyme two um, for suspect one and suspect two. So your students are actually performing four restriction digests. And it's really important that they follow the table and they're careful, um, you know, but after we analyze the results, if there are mistakes, you know, this is an important thing for your students to remember, you know, science is messy, we're all human, and sometimes we make mistakes. Um, for those of you who have been with me on more than one live stream, you know, sometimes I make a mistake because I'm talking, um, you know, and this is just part of science. Um, you know, we keep notes of everything in our lab notebook. And then when we're doing our analysis, you know, um, an important thing to have your students do um, is to think about, you know, their experiment, why things went wrong or why they went right, and then to explain it and think about what they would do the next time. Um, so for teacher prep, you are going to prepare and aliquot the restriction enzymes and store them in ice when not in use. And in general, um, in a normal year, you might have all of your sections in one day. Um, we generally recommend you prepare the restriction enzyme and use it on the day that you have prepared it. However, um, you know, you may have sections on multiple days in a normal year or, you know, spread out across the week in this kind of unusual year. And we want to make sure that you have high quality enzymes to be able to do with all of your students. And so if you do have sections on multiple days, um, after you prepare the enzyme and aliquot it, you're going to take those aliquots and put them right in the freezer. Um, because the prepared enzymes are going to degrade if you leave them on ice or put them in the fridge. So put them in the freezer. Um, I do recommend you use it within a week for best results. Um, but that means if you have, if all of your students over the course of a week are doing the same experiment, um, that would mean you could prepare the enzyme on Monday and on Friday. Your state students will be able to use the same kit. Um, once the samples are set up, um, you're going to digest the samples at 37 degrees for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, you definitely need the, the temperature of 37 degrees. Um, you know, if we think about these enzymes, they come from bacteria. bacteria most bacteria are going to grow well at that 37 degree mark. And so that's where their enzymes have evolved to be most active. And so if you do it at room temperature, you might not digest as well. If you do it warmer, you may kill the enzymes. Um, now, most of the, the enzymes that we send with our kits are most active at 37 degrees, but there are, there are enzymes that are better at 20, 25 degrees. And so if you're using an enzyme that is not in the kit for other purposes, you know, you're going to want to make sure to look at the manufacturer's instructions to use both the right buffer and, and to use the right incubation temperature. And so this is actually an experiment, a great experiment to do um, in uh, the context like this year, because if you do have a one hour lab period, 
your students can complete the restriction digest in one period. Um, they're gonna put the loading dye in those samples and then you can freeze those samples until the next lab section. So there's not gonna be any um, change in the quality of your results if you do not do this experiment and analyze the results in the same day. So um, this is the restriction digest. Um, well, this is the analysis of the restriction digest. We're gonna talk about electrophoresis now. Um, so while we were chatting, um, our samples have been running through the gel and separating by size. Um, and so remember, um, you know, I had the precast gel, um, that's our scientific jello. We placed the gel into our gel chamber where it was covered by electrophoresis buffer. We loaded the samples into uh, the wells um, and then we placed the safety lid on the gel chamber and turned on our power supply. And that power supply generates the currents that we need for electrophoresis. And so while we were discussing the restriction enzymes, our DNA samples were separating into different bands based on their size. So now we're gonna talk about what is going on in that gel. So in our experiment, agarose gel electrophoresis is being used to separate our fragments by size. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe it's allergies, something in the air. Um, but I don't know. Um, thank you for bearing with me with my scratchy throat. So um, if we were to look at our gel, if we were to pick it up and feel it in our hands, an agarose gel appears solid. It feels solid. If you were to pick up this gel, it would feel like a thick jello. It's still soft, and, and you know, if you squeeze it, there is that that is that pliability. Um, but um, you know, it, it's still soft, but less jiggly than the jello you might make for dessert. At the molecular level, however, this gel is full of pores, which are microscopic little tunnels that pass through the gel, and these tunnels are going to affect how our DNA separates into bands. So as the current is pushing and pulling the DNA fragments through the gel, the molecules have to find their way through the pores. They may have to twist and turn to get through the channels, um, unwind certain areas of secondary structure. And since it's easier for smaller molecules to move through the gel than larger molecules, the DNA is gonna separate into bands by size with larger molecules near, near the wells and smaller molecules further down the gel. Because the molecules with different charges travel at different speeds um, and in different sizes travel at different speeds, they are going to become separated and form discrete bands within the gel. So, and then here we can see the, the distinct bands. And so if we are looking for an analogy for electrophoresis, you know, we can think about DNA molecules as being like fish swimming down the stream. We have some fish that are large and some fish that are small. And so they're moving downstream with the current. And that's thinking about our DNA being moved through this buffer th with the current. Um, but then we throw you know, a wrench into the system or a net across the river. And that's like our agarose gel. And so um, there may be rocks in the river. Or, and these are going to be obstacles that are going to get in the way of our fish as they're traveling downstream. Um, the smaller fish may be able to navigate through any tight turns and twists or fit through the holes in a net more easily than the larger fish. Um, we're not bringing predators into this, into this equation yet, just we're thinking about physical obstacles. Um, and so we can think about the DNA as our fish, mo our, our DNA molecules as our fish, um, the current of the stream as our electrical current, and then the obstacles as our agarose matrix. And so if we were to look at the results of our DNA electrophoresis experiment, we're gonna find smaller bands at the bottom and the larger bands at the top. We always run a molecular weight marker with our DNA bands that, with DNA bands of known size so that we can determine the sizes of our unknown fragments in our experimental samples. But there is one more problem. Um, DNA is clear and colorless, and so we can't see our DNA bands with the naked eye. So we need to visualize it using a reagent, a DNA stain, um, that is going to specifically stick to our DNA. There are many DNA stains available for use in the classroom laboratory, but I'm going to tell you about my two favorite, which are CyberSafe and Flash Blue. So Flash Blue is a visible DNA stain, meaning that it is a molecule that binds to DNA, but we can see it with the naked eye. And one of the easiest to use, I think personally, is Flash Blue. Um, there are two protocols that we can use to stain the DNA. One is a quick protocol that can be done in about 20 minutes or so. 
I actually use the overnight protocol. I tend to prefer it. Um, it is a protocol where you dilute the flash blue and then you're going to soak the gel, gel for three hours to overnight. And I will show you um, when we get to the results and conclusions slide, um, I will show you the results of a flash blue gel and this cyber safe gel. Um, but I just want to let this run first before I move everything out of the way. Um, so I love doing the overnight protocol. It's a great option if you have a shorter lab period or you will see your students the next day. Um, you just soak the gel and you come back to it the next day. And so the next stain um, is CyberSafe DNA stain, which is a fluorescent DNA stain. Um, I love this stain um, for many reasons. Um, let's talk about the stain itself first. It's a fluorescent dye that's going to specifically bind to double-stranded DNA. Um, and we add it to the gel and it actually stains the DNA while the gel is running, meaning we don't have to spend a lot of the time after staining the gel, staining the gel after running it. So while we are running these fragments through the gel, the DNA is binding to the dye in the gel. And that basically means that we can just pull the gel out of the chamber and put it into the electro and put it on a true blue too. Um, and then we're able to visualize the results right away. If you're using the edge, the cool thing is the edge has a paddle on the side and you can turn on the blue light while the gel is running to monitor the progress um, of the samples, which is very cool. And so because each DNA molecule is decorated with this fluorescent dye, um, and it's decorated with many molecules, um, we get a lot of extra sensitivity because the DNA is gonna be bound by these dye molecules, they're gonna absorb the light, and then they are gonna emit more than emit a bright light. So one thing I always do like to point out now is some considerations for hybrid um, or a hybrid learning, um, you know, because we do have these schedules. Um, you know, one thing that we can do is to definitely um, save time is to prepare your gels ahead of time. Um, you can store them in the refrigerator. Um, you can either have your students do it or you can do it yourself. Um, and so, you know, you're just going to take the gels, um, store them in Ziploc bags, under buffer. Um, if you are using CyberSafe in the gel, the one thing you do want to be careful is to not use a ton of buffer, you know, maybe two mils or so, because you don't want that CyberSafe to diffuse out of the gel because that can affect your resolution. If you're not, if you're using flash blue, um, you can just put them in a Tupperware container and have them all together um, in a container, no big deal. Um, after electrophoresis, you can store those gels for visualization even a week later, um, you know, but again, you're going to, in this case, you do want to store it in a small Ziploc bag with a little bit less buffer because you don't want your bands to diffuse and the dye to diffuse and fade. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at our gels. Um, here, um, I have the results. Um, stained by with the blue light and um, let me turn off this gel box I'm going to move it out of the way and I'm going to actually turn off my extra light to give us a little bit more um, to give us a little bit more with our true blue too um, so let me get that centered and um, let me start with the flash blue stained gel or actually let me start with the cyber stained gel because then I can get this chamber out of the way which will make it easier all right so you can see um, I'm just taking the gel right out I just took the gel right out of the chamber I'm placing it on our true blue and turning on our true blue too and let me see hopefully let me move it a little closer over here our gel is warm um, one thing is that you know um, as the electricity passes through the buffer, you are generating heat. So you, you know, we have a lot of venting here um, and the picture looks really good to me, but sometimes the fogging um, will affect the way it looks on screen. Oh, let me rotate my gel. Um, and so what we can see here um, is here we have our DNA ladder um, and the picture on the screen is going to be the same um, lanes. Um, it is just, you were just using um, blue on there and then we're using the cyber safe here and we can see we have our um, our suspect sample a our suspect sample b and then we are our crime scene dna sample a and b we have our suspect a and b um, and then we have suspect 2 a and b and what we can see is that you know if we're just looking at 
you know, this first lane, so this is our DNA with enzyme A, um, we can see we have, so that would be this lane, this lane, and this lane, and they all are going to look pretty similar, right? So we have the same two fragments, they're at about the same size, um, and so if we were just using that one site within our DNA, um, we wouldn't actually be able to distinguish between these two people and figure out who um, may have been at the crime scene. And so um, we can see that the two enzymes cut the DNA differently. Um, and again, this is based on their sequence. And then even if we look at the lane two, you know, we can see that they cut DNA differently between the two suspects. And so this is important again, because these differences are based on the sequence. Now, when we look at the DNA with the second enzyme, what we can see is here is where we're getting real differences. And when we compare, um, you know, what we, my light is on in here, so it's a little bit harder to see those bottom bands. Um, um, and we'll actually see them a little bit better with the flash blue stained gel because the um, ambient light won't disturb it as much and, you know, a little more sensitivity there. But, um, you know, what we can see is that top band um, is the same between our crime scene DNA um, and our suspect DNA. And that is um, likely gives us suspect two um, as the person who done it. All right, so let me bring the other gel in. All right, and so we're gonna, the nice thing about the True Blue 2 is that, you know, you have the white light feature as well. And so you may choose to do some experiments with cyber um, and some with flash blue, and then this is gonna give you greater versatility. So let's bring the gel over here. Um, and you see we are using the white light feature now. Um, and what you can see is that the flash blue stained gels, um, you know, we have the dark blue bands on a lighter blue background, and we see that same banding pattern that we saw before. Um, so we see that, um, and actually this gel, I feel like it ran better um, than the gel that I was loading um, while we were chatting. So they're part of the reason some of those bands might have been a little fuzzy was because I didn't get all the sample in the wells. Um, but you could still see a really strong signal. Um, so what you can see, again, here is our crime scene DNA, suspect one, suspect two, and that suspect DNA two, profile two matches up where suspect one doesn't. Um, and the banding patterns is different between people, but also between enzymes. And again, that is based on its sequence. Um, so we have come, um, and so from a forensic standpoint, um, you know, one thing I always do like to point out um, is that, um, you know, if we were um, in the crime scene lab, it's important to point out um, that this is just one piece of evidence that would be built into a case um, which would be used to convict or exonerate a person. Um, DNA evidence isn't necessarily the only piece of evidence that's important. So I'm going to wrap up now. If you have any additional questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, you know, we've come to the end of this experiment, uh, covered a ton of information um, about enzymes. Um, I do think it's fascinating that restriction enzymes kind of evolved as this immune system for bacteria. Um, where these enzymes recognizing the invading viral DNA and chop it into pieces. And we've now been able to develop them into powerful biotechnology tools, which cut DNA at specific nucleotide sequences for use in restriction mapping, DNA fingerprinting, and they are also an absolutely indispensable part of molecular cloning. Today's technique, DNA fingerprinting, uses restriction enzymes to identify sequence differences in an individual's DNA. Um, each digested DNA will produce different fragment patterns based on its unique sequence. And these markers are heritable and can be linked to hereditary heredity um, between individuals, identity, and genetic disease. Um, Maria just put in the chat box, she brought up our promotions. Um, next week is Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, so make sure to enter our contest at edvotech.com backslash contest. And we're also going to be doing social media giveaways um, through Instagram, through Twitter, and through Facebook. So make sure you follow us and stay tuned. Um, you know, we're giving away some exciting equipment, again, including that Edvotech Edge, which is gorgeous. Um, I will, oh, that is the wrong link for the presentation. I forgot to change it. Please do not follow that link. Um, to request the presentation, follow the one that um, Maria and I have placed into the chat box. And we will be posting the presentation and the slides in the next few days to our website and to YouTube. 
Um, if you want us to email you when they're available, please fill out the form and we'll contact you. Um, in addition, if you do want a professional development certificate, please be sure to check off the box um, and I will email that to you um, in the next week or so. Um, it's 429. If there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. And, you know, this is one of my favorite experiments because I think restriction enzymes are just the coolest. Um, if you need us for anything, please reach out um, at info at edvotech.com or try one of our social media channels. Um, and we really look forward to um, helping you get biotechnology into your classroom. Um, thank you all so much for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, we look forward to seeing you next time at another biotechnology live stream. Um, if you haven't joined us for previous live streams, we have them all archived in a playlist um, on, our, on our YouTube page um, for review at your, um, at your leisure. So thanks again. Um, great chatting with you all. Um, and have a fantastic day and a fantastic week and a fantastic weekend. Um, I'll talk to you all soon. Bye now.